Hello, Syra. I hope it's a nice, bright, sunny afternoon in New York. Please let me know if you can hear me and if the picture is okay for now. I hope we have no technical difficulties today. Keeping my fingers crossed. I have another book that uh, is a must own for anybody interested in uh, heritage architecture, especially um, Pakistan. Saira, if you don't have this book, um, it's worth, uh, worth owning. Brilliant historian, archaeologist, Mr. Dani, one of his brilliant uh, books as well, most well reputed archaeologist of this region. Hello Heritage Tracks, good to see you. Hi G. I'm glad it's a sunny morning in New York and that you can hear me clearly. This is great, good news, good news. It's certainly a bright sunny afternoon here and um, to be honest it's really hot. It's hot. It certainly feels like summer is here in Karachi, there is no doubt about that. Hi Farooq, how are you doing? So. Um, Welcome back, all of these fantastic familiar faces. Assalamu alaikum to everyone. While I wait for uh, Mariam Nizam to sign on from Sydney, um, welcome back. This is a uh, live session chat session number 19 from the Jugalbandi series uh, between Jean Gardner and other guests. Um, so I'm hoping that we will have another exciting uh, conversation with Mariam, who is uh, extremely dynamic. Um, and knows her heritage architecture inside out, without a doubt. She's been working on Makli, which is why I was doing my research to make sure that I had my information on the history of Makli in place because in case she asks me a difficult question, I don't want to be stuck. So looking up my Makli history. Uh, thank you, G. Yes, <laughs> I've, I, it's because I've shaved <laughs> and trimmed down and sort of made myself presentable for Mariam, who uh, is a is a dear friend but also an extremely well respected professional in the heritage architecture industry so I thought the least I can do is uh, look vaguely presentable for her chat I do try for everyone as well but Mariam is special uh, in her own way so thank you for seeing that and uh, appreciating it I'm also wearing a collared t-shirt <laughs> um, so where is Mariam it's four o'clock means nine o'clock Sydney time. Uh, others have signed up. Great to see some new faces signing up as well. Jeanette, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Jean. Jean Gardner is here as well. This is amazing. Hi, Jean. Um, must be early morning for you. Hope the birds are out singing and the sun is out. Thank you, G. Mariam is here. Let's bring her on board. Oh my God, this is so cool. Sarah, thank you for joining us from Lahore, I believe. Hello, Jean. Good to see you as always. Good morning, Jean Gardner from the woods and forests of uh, Pennsylvania. So I've just sent a message to Mariam waiting for her to sign up and then we can bombard her with all sorts of questions and comments and queries and see what she thinks about all of what we've been talking about in terms of the future of heritage education future of education in general also post pandemic in the sort of digital age but this is a book that for all of you who are interested please uh, get yourself a copy it's worth owning uh, without a doubt it's definitely worth keeping in your uh, libraries he's a brilliant brilliant archaeologist and historian one of many books so fantastic what happened to Maria Maswe my mic and camera settings need to be altered okay it's all right Maria 
just switch it all on and we're here waiting for you. So these chats have uh, really taken on an interesting turn for those of you who've been following it. And I guess there'll be some who'll be watching this uh, once it's recorded. It's really, they've really grown beautifully organically and the content has gotten richer and deeper, much more than I had expected, much more than I had planned. Uh, when I started doing these chats, originally the idea was to just talk about what we do at the editors uh, to answer people's questions. And there've been many questions about why we do what we do and what is the purpose of it. Um, that's how I'd started these. And you know, then it, gotten, uh, it got deeper. Uh, the book's name, Farooq, is Tatta, Makli Monuments, Islamic Architecture by, here you go. I'm sorry it's backwards because of this, but that says Tatta Makli Monuments, Islamic Architecture by Dr. Ahmed Hassan Dani on top. This is the book that's a must own for everyone who's interested in Makli architecture and history. And then there's several other books. There's Makli Nama, which I also have, which I was reading earlier, but this is the one that I picked up to read before uh, Makli, uh, Mariam came on board. So we've been discussing some pretty interesting things um, with our Thursday guests that have been very diverse and all pretty uh, senior in their own professional fields. We've also had input from a teenager because we're looking at the future of education for a generation that's new and not us. So I thought it'd be nice to have her input, Ekta Shea, who um, is a student at Lyceum School, Karachi. So it's great to have her input and feed that into everything else that we're co-creating and constructing in the background. Um, this may be something that takes a long time. It might have little modules and pieces that we can use as uh, pilot programs to start. Uh, yesterday, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who said, why don't you start an online university? And now that Cambridge University, for instance, has said that they will have no real face-to-face -face classes, that they will be doing everything online um, we're not probably that far off a similar idea here. But the question is that, you know, how do we get people, like I said, how do we get the new generation curious and excited and trigger their imagination? And then, you know, Gene and I have spoken about the idiom, uh, the metaphor of the horse, bringing the horse to the water, we can do, but how do we force it to drink it? Well, you know, then you get into the conversation of the body and the geometry and understanding the body and reading oneself and being aware of one's own needs and desires and how does one create and generate uh, curiosity to start exploring one's own imagination and you know what is what what is the playfulness in all of this and how do we get people to start playing with these ideas and playing with their thoughts and using that sense of play to come into the learning environment and have it not be just a um, force fed genre of just pushing information without any Q&A without any critical analysis into people's brains but actually getting them to enjoy the information and develop a central relationship with it, understand the communication, understand semantics, understand language, different types of language from hieroglyphics to uh, the Germanic languages and English. So there's, there's all sorts of languages that take us from pictorial to uh, characters. And if we look at pictorial languages, then of course, you know, then we jump right into the digital age, which is all about pictures. And you all know that it seems people have just stopped reading. They're going uh, mostly, they just want a quick fix and they want the picture to tell them whatever is happening. So um, it's not something that we can really do much about except look at a, a language which is universal and a language which is universal. Uh, let me, sorry, Mariam, let me try from here because we've already lost 30 minutes. Let me try you from here, hang on. See, there you are. Hi. Don't look How so stressed out. Technology us every day. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, we're fine. We, the only thing is we have a one hour deadline. Yeah. So we're behind by a little bit. That's fine. You still have 15 minutes yeah. uh, where I get to torture you and, of course, derive lots of pleasure from that. Listen, how are you doing? What's it like? It's evening in Sydney, huh? You had a good day? Yeah, it's nine right now. Um, yeah, I've had a good day. Um, I think um, as is customary in Sydney, uh, before we start, 
I'd like to do a small acknowledgement of country. So Please. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that I am on Aboriginal land and wow. um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of country who are the Gadigal people of the Iwara nation. And, um, and I recognize their continued connection to land, water, and culture. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And, Beautiful. Yeah, I love so, it. Yeah, so this so, is, I mean, uh, it's very, uh, very uh, customary uh, to do that before we start any meeting or public forum. Um, so, yeah, I thought we'd start with that. That's so beautiful. So as you can see, uh, Jean Gardner has already responded to that. Uh, Mariam, I know you've been following some of these talks and Jean is uh, a professor at Parsons School of Design and a consultant at Columbia. And at Dalton, she's been my professor many years ago when I was at Parsons and has been a mentor since then. So these are the kind of discussions we've been having and what a beautiful, beautiful, lovely. I feel like I should just walk away and leave you with the the audience because your audience today is people who will respect this, who will understand this, who will appreciate it, who will absorb it in all beauty. So do you want to explain to us why you did this and why it's customary in Australia to do this? Because nobody else has done this before, including my give us um, some background to So I think I think one of um is very uh interesting because we're right now uh the coming week is uh, National Reconciliation Week. And um, during this time, uh, we're trying, like the government is trying to um, reconcile the tragedies that uh, befell the Aboriginal people at the hands of the settlers. And, um, and this acknowledgement of country is basically a kind of, um, gesture to extend to the acknowledgement of the, the indigenous population of Australia. Um, and it's important to kind of, um, you know, because there was such a long history of uh, kind of disparity and kind of the, the, the horrible, you know, historic um, injustices that befell the indigenous people. And this is just a kind of acknowledgement of the fact that we are on Aboriginal land. And, um, and it is, um, I think, an important discussion to have when, uh, when the rights of indigenous peoples are, um, you know, endangered in so many of uh, the provinces, lands in the world, you know, globally, I think. Um, and, and this is, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a small thing and just acknowledging the fact that, you know, because the Aboriginal people um, have, uh, in, are in possession of the oldest living um, culture of the world. And, um, and they have a very intrinsic connection to their land and to, and you know, everything is kind of connected to country and connected to the land. So religion, culture, tradition. So it's just a kind of under, like a, a bit of a homage to, to that. Wow, that's some tribute. And uh, um, and, I'm and not it's, sure. it, yeah. Oh, Mariam, and, It's a, it's a pretty standard. I haven't really deviated. This is a very standard kind of um, uh, acknowledgement of country. Uh, we do it um, at any kind of public forum. It happens uh, when you're writing a report or when you're writing a book. Most of the Australian websites will have an acknowledgement to country. Um, and it's, it's an important discussion because that's where the country is at a standpoint, right? Like everything begins from that, that acknowledgement that we are on indigenous land and that it belonged to people before the settlers. And because, you know, Australia is a settler, uh, uh, it's, it's like a migrant country. It's like, I think most of the 
people are, um, ha are, have migrated from somewhere. And that acknowledgement that you are on Aboriginal land, is, is, uh, on Indigenous land, is, is, is very important. I learned something new today. Thank you. I knew, I knew you would do this. <laughs> I knew you would do this. I mean, like blown away. So much for, you know, all the questions I had in my hand, my head, <laughs> gone, dissolved out the window. So now you have to help me. Now you have to help me. This is, this is, I knew this would happen. So how, how, would, how would I do an acknowledgement of country for where I am? And I don't want to use the P word or the I word, but if we were to, can we do an acknowledgement of country based on the river Indus? I mean, what would be indigenous here? Because the people are not really indigenous. We've had so much movement. Yeah. The only thing indigenous in our river um, Indus. So what would be my acknowledgement of country? I think, I think the, the, the word country here has a, a very different connotation um because it's not necessarily bound by political or um well geographical yes but but political or social um boundaries that are that are very modern um i think the the understanding of country in in indigenous or Abor uh, aboriginal um societies is is very different because um, uh, they have um, you know a whole range of affiliations to country and um, a lot of their religion is um, is derived from a deep connection to country. Um, so um, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, be able to help you with that. Um, I could say that this understanding of of where you're from is something that is that is important, but necess not necessarily translating that acknowledgement um, because it means something a lot more uh, to the indigenous Australians than 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 just you know a, a piece of land. So uh, uh, if we rephrase, um, supposing I change the word country. Because uh, you see, for me, country, Mariam, sounds like a political definition. But if you yeah, look at yeah, yeah. Any, of, any of the indigenous, right? So it's the Aboriginal, the Eskimo, the Native Americans, the Mayans. Mm -hmm. They all have a connection to land, to mm -hmm. earth. Mm -hmm. And whether they're tribal and nomadic or they're people that stay put and they're rural and agrarian and they're not gatherers moving around, they still have an inherent... Um, genetic and spiritual connection to land. So mm. land to earth, which, mm. which I think in maybe in urbanity we've forgotten and we've gotten really far from. So in, in yeah. our case, if I was to look at try and find a way of acknowledging country, and I don't like that word country, but if we were to acknowledge land, um, which makes my life a little bit easier because if I look at the history of Pakistan, and I, I don't want to use that word. If I look at the history of this region, and yeah, you're an expert. Word. Region is a good word. I, I prefer the word region. Yeah, um, I do it, too. It's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, it, is, it is very intriguing when you try, try to translate that to, to right. um, South Asia. Um, yeah. And um, because we do have this, um, this intrinsic, I mean, and even though there has been this kind of um, migration of lots and like amalgamation of lots of different kinds of uh, cultures and people, there is something that's very, very intrinsically South Asian, right? Um, we've made it our own. Whatever has happened around us, it becomes part of, of the culture. And, and when you have culture that's so old or ancient or even prehistoric, um, it, it, it's, it makes it so much more difficult to kind of translate into very, um, you know, niches that, oh, okay, so this is political, this is um, geographic, this is social, this, it, it just... It needs to be um, a lot more fluid, this kind of um, acknowledgement in an area like that. Um, 
I, I, I don't know if, if, if that makes you know, yesterday, I mean, since Monday, when Jean and I last spoke in our Jugal Bandi series, mm -hmm. there's been this, uh, we've, we've pulled out different elements to try and figure out the future of education using uh, heritage architecture as a channel, because that's what I do. And of course, the digital, digital age, we have no other option but to head in that direction. Yeah. So we were looking at what kinds of things generate curiosity and imagination and repeatedly, Mariam, repeatedly, we keep going back to indigenous people of the land, people who've done things like pre Mohenjo-daro games, stories, understanding of what to build. You know, remember the game Pitu? We played Pitu as kids. And, yeah. you know, there are artists who've made, a, who've made a, like a career out of stacking stones in random locations all over the world and then calling it sculpture and earth art and whatnot. And we've been doing this for kids for millennia, right? So you stack up the stones. And then you run around and you throw a ball and you let them fall apart and you reconstruct them and then do it, you do it again and again and again, right? And then there's, there's the toys that we were found in Mojalaro, there was games of chess. So this whole intellectual uh, challenges had started much earlier. And Mojalaro, I, I bring up, unlike Makli, which you've spent so much time working on, Makli was 13th, 14th century onwards, it's pretty modern. Yeah. But Mojadaro yeah. is pre-democracy, it's pre-monarchy, it was an egalitarian society. And, and in terms of ancient siblings, Sumeria, uh, Mesopotamia, Sumeria, Egypt, and the Indus Valley civilization were all siblings evolving within a few uh, millennia of each other before everything else exploded. So I wondered that, you know, would that be, would that be our indigenous? But what, what do you think? I mean, I feel like for me, this this, what you've just said, which is so beautiful, must revolve around the river Indus because that's what has been the magnet to bring everybody here from Indus Valley civilization settlers all the way down to the Chinese. Yeah, I actually, I actually agree, uh, you know, for, for, pa for Pakistan specifically, um, the telling of, of history for Pakistan uh, it, it, is I mean I I, I don't want to point fingers or anything, but I think a lot of it is um, whitewashed um, to fit an Islamic <laughs> narrative um, because we just seem to move from very conveniently from um, from the Indus Valley um, to I mean if you look at uh, school like school books they, they it very conveniently skips large parts of the history of the chronological order of, of, of historic events, right? Um, yes. And, 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 and it kind of very conveniently boxes and puts things aside. And then also there's this exaltation of, of Islamic um, conquerors without having any discussion on, on you know, um, what they actually did. Um, but 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 for me, I've always um, thought that read the reading of history for Pakistan, if it's if it's connected to to the river, it it creates um, it creates a more um, open and kind of inclusive historic um, narrative for us. Um, and, 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 and it's not just the River Indus, right? Because it connects to Kabul, it connects to Tibet, it connects to, you know, it connects to, to all, of, all of India. Um, and, and it really was the, the kind of, for a long time, I think, um, India started once you crossed the Indus. So, so for a lot of it, yes, I do agree that that this connection to to river, uh, to the river Indus is is very important. And and I mean there is this um, there is this discussion in a lot of the for I I I I saw you had spoken in one of your talks about um, um, the Kalash people, right? And there's this whole argument about them being Greek or them being um, or them having Zoroastrian uh, roots. But a lot of it is actually because some of the research that I have done, I mean, I could be incorrect, but some of the research that I have done 
has led me to kind of um, an indication that they were were are the indigenous people of of the of the Hindu Kush area, and that their religion predates um, uh, like it's it's like an early form of of uh, Vedic tradition, um, yeah. and that and that their you know their language is 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 uh is a is a dialect of ancient or proto iranian so so it kind of like so they they still exist they're still speaking a language that is proto iranian right in its origin so i mean so so there is this there are pockets of indigenous people um but but it's i think i think that indigenous discussion for south asia is very different because it's so ancient it predates kind of any um it could only be conjecture right and so i think it makes it a little difficult for us to point at i mean this is something that would be very interesting to study um of course but i i i'm i'm a little uncertain of of like the the application of the word indigenous in um, in Pakistan or India or, or uh, South, the South Asia region generally. Because, you know, there's too many, there's too many issues with like, oh, did the Aryans come from Central Asia? Did they push us out? Were they white skinned? Were we brown? Like it just opens up a whole conundrum of like color and race and, you know, all of that, which, which is something that that needs to be i think it's it's a it's a discussion that can be had but but it's it's a discussion that's based on a lot of like conjecture yeah but true so the flip side of that same coin is that you know we this region of the indus river sits right at the edge of the near east we're at the eastern easternmost edge of the near east and the westernmost edge of Southeast Asia, because Afghanistan mm -hmm. is not Southeast Asia. We are. We're the beginning yeah. of Southeast Asia. And the top of us is blocked off by the Karakoram, mm -hmm. the Hindu Kush, and the Himalayan mm -hmm. mountains. So mm -hmm. this is the doorway. And I just wonder if you're right, 100% right, that indigenous doesn't work for us. But how do we do an homage to our diversity as any of these lectures start? Or our the beauty of the fact that from north to south everything changes within a few hours the landscape the people the food the costume right so there's no there's no whole intact watertight indigenous that you can point at and say this is indigenous and this is not we mm. are this melange collage of different influences uh, influences from 5000 years at least if not more till now and if the collage are considered indigenous then um, I mean, it's relevant to that region. That indigene indigeneity of theirs does not really apply to Southern Sindh, for instance, or the Makran coastal belt, right? Because it's completely different geography, completely different climate, completely yeah. different. So I just, I think it would be amazing. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think it would no, be, I, it would just be, yeah, I think it would just be, you know, like a, like an acknowledgement of diversity. Maybe that's something that we should, we should, we should be uh, looking at because, you know, I think there is this, this need to acknowledge a secular identity rather than an Islamic one. Um, you know, it, it, I think it, it does, um, it is an important discussion. Like it's a, it's an important point that you make that the, you know there's that we're like at this crossroads of of different societies and cultures and people, and and I think acknowledging that is probably the best way forward. And and even in and and as I said that that whole um, you know segmentation of historical events maybe that would lead to that not happening anymore because we would be acknowledging that yes we are at the crossroads and yes we have always been part of a larger discussion and a larger route you know we've always been on the silk route we've always played an important role um you know even if you go um into um the the fata area 
or Khyber Pakhtunkhwa as it is now, you know. Um, it, it, they were they were you know tr- letting people pass through their 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 areas till till very recently you know and 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 charging money for it right so so like i mean i think i think it's so important for us to kind of acknowledge the fact that we've all i mean even now cpec is is exactly that right yeah. it's it's the root yeah. so pakistan's always been at the root of of uh, at the at the main route so i mean acknowledging that is probably the the way place to start i mean it's quite amazing that you know which we're, we're trying to after i think a long time this discussion has come up of how to acknowledge and celebrate in a semantic form our because first of all most people don't even and what that term diversity means within the boundaries uh, you know we're a, we're a border region that of pakistan but if e- even if we move those terms aside we move pakistan aside we move india aside india is a term that's been adopted by very recently it was not there at the time of the silk route or the um mm. river indus was river sindhu and you know yeah. india that we read about uh, historically was actually this little strip of land because if you look at where the conquerors went went maximum as far out as what is today's delhi and they went back even alexander the great who spent so much time here actually his last resting place when he felt really ill was in lasbela in balochistan yeah. and yeah. Even, even many of us living here don't know that that you know, come in from really interesting cuz uh, when i was working in pakistan someone had contacted me about a mound uh somewhere near um somewhere near uh gujarat and um he he was of the opinion that this was the mound or tomb of alexander's horse um mm. and i found that very interesting um i never really got into it or what you know but he had sent me a whole list of of documents and um you know indications of of why he believes that this is um the tomb of alexander's horse you know um so yeah i mean it's it's crazy we have like the strangest of things um everywhere i mean you you drive up down uh the gt road and you can see like you know old ruins of of things and and you go closer you find out that they're like from the 2nd century ad um which is which is like mind blowing if you actually think about it um but but yeah i think i think there is this because there's so much of it uh there is this kind of disassociation with it which is very unfortunate um also also the documentation right so there's there's two parts of what you uh hit, you hit a very sensitive nerve which is this idea of history that's been kept from us by design to be able to control the masses in a better way so that they don't question and they don't have to you know they, their empowerment is reduced so first of all the do- history has been documented i find as i wander around pakistan that a lot of this history like the mound with alexander's horse in it is not documented so research document and then of course you know that all has to be double checked and double checked and seen if it's authentic authentic so the authentication process has to happen so first of all our documentation of what we have which is enormous i mean i every time i go out on some tour every time i'm going up and down the same plot of land i find something new just like you said on the gt on the way to hub on the hyderabad somebody will by the way sir you see this go and see that and suddenly this incredible shrine shows up or incredible tombs show up of people we didn't know or we heard about and there's a lot of history that's in our folklore and in our mythology which because it's non linear just gets pushed aside as irrelevant and i think this would be a great time for us to start documenting like marvi does right the oral history project is really important mm. um i think uh, uh, sharmin does it with with her work so i think across the country there is mythology and folklore that needs to be brought into the forefront and looked at as part of our doc- historical documentation process mate what do you think okay so so there's two things in this 
So one um, is when you say that there's this lack of documentation. I feel like there has been a lot of documentation done, but it's just siloed. Um, there's this kind of, you know, you're, I'm not you, but you're working in your office, you know, collecting stuff. I'm working in my office collecting stuff. But if you want something, I'm going to be like, ah, uh, do I really want to give it to him? What if he misuses right. it? You know, there's this kind of issue with documentation. I feel like a lot of documentation has been done by the government. A lot of it has been done by private organizations. But there's no kind of collective archiving. Um, right. and, and also, like, so for example, since I've been here, there is, um, there's, there's also this lack of, of like public uh, organizations that are working in actively digitizing archives. Um, so since I've been here, the, uh, this is a, a, really interesting, uh, a really interesting resource that I, I feel like you should have a look at is the National Library of, of New South Wales. Um, and it's called Trove. And what they do is that they have recorded all the newspapers, all the photographs, all the, like everything, anything you want to find, you want to find out about Mr. Jim Smith. About him when he died, when he was born, you know, um, uh, what the house look, looked like. So, so it's, it's, I think, I think that's, that's the, that's the issue, right? Like there's no nationally available resource that's digitized. And, and as you know, I did work on a very interesting uh, digitization database for cultural heritage in Pakistan but that never saw the light of day. So, so that's, that's, an, that's one of the biggest issues is that it, there is documentation. Lots of people are doing involved in documentation. There's a lot of doubling up of documentation as well. Like I'm doing the documentation, you're doing a documentation where we don't have to do it twice. Like if you've done right. it, why can't we share it? So that's, that's right. one of the biggest issues with documentation. Um, and the second thing was... Um, with regards to, um, I completely lost my thought. <laughs> Fine. Documentation, we're talking about doc documentation and history being removed from us by design. There's not enough yeah. documentation. You're saying that it's yeah. not shared. It's not in the singular yeah. archival environment. Yeah, I think, and, and then also, of course, the folklore um, and, and like oral history. Um, there is this, um, you know, this change in, in, you know, most of the international um, world on, on oral history. And there is a lot of intangible heritage that is being, um, is being listed. Um, unfortunately, Pakistan has no intangible uh, world heritage uh, listing or you know a recommendation even for um intangible heritage listing but however um there there can be avenues where this is even if it's not um you know because like the japanese tea ceremony for example is an intangible heritage that's 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 on the world heritage list right so even if we can't have something on the world heritage list on a, on a national level or a, on a local level or a state uh, like a provincial level you could have um you know intangible heritage listing and folklore is part of it part of that um and and i think I think one of the one of the biggest issues with oral history or like recording of oral tradition or or intangible heritage is is that you know sci because we document things on a scientific grounds there is that kind of difficulty of kind of rationalizing how to record um tradition which is intangible um specifically if it's not like if it's craft it probably is easier but if it's stories or you know because like for example 
um i don't know if you've ever seen those that katputli ka khel you know where they play like they have puppets and they're you know telling a story but it's very different because if you if you if it's a master telling you the puppet using the puppets to tell you a story it's very different versus if it's like his understudy right and so it's the telling of the story that is as important as the story right so so that's what that's what makes intangible heritage so difficult and and also very difficult for professionals who are trying to record it which is why it's so interesting um but it is it is an avenue that that needs to be explored but it's it's also an avenue that is internationally being discussed on how this this can be um recorded and saved and um there's a lot of you know cuz um there used to be the sound archive in in lok birsa in islamabad i don't know if that's still in existence or not but they used to collect a lot of sounds like for example the sounds um, of of like just for example um covid like sounds during covid what the city sounds like during covid it probably never sounded like this ever isn't that an important um you know resource to 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 capture at this time because obviously the present and that's that there is this need to kind of maybe record the present as well which is something that we're not doing because we're so busy trying to focus on what have we have lost Yeah listen would you want to look at some of these comments and questions coming in uh, Maryam this is really cool so Marvi has said talked about an alternative history that's where analysis comes in investigative research uh Jean thinks that lacking grounding which is something mentioned by Adnan a great insight literally not standing on the ground work in its holistic sense look at this so Tanya Karim is an architect uh who's based out of Dhaka and mm-hmm. she has a question how can we attach value and significance to intangible heritage to reinforce regional identity preservation here's a good question for you well i think well i think i think that's you you've kind of answered your own question haven't you really there because intangible heritage is uh, about regional identity preservation right it is um you know for example just if we take something as simple as like um embroidery right um there's a different taka in different parts of of india and pakistan right and just preserving that that kind of motive the way that the women stitch it the the colors that they use it is part of a regional identity we may not understand that but but that's that's i mean that's what we're gra- gra- grappling on right Yeah. I'm just trying to respond to Marvi. So I've this uh, Lok Birsa archive in Islamabad. Yeah, it's it, it was it was pretty bad when I went which was like in 2011. It was almost all already gone. They used to have film, they had quite a bit of stuff, but it's I, I it was gone even I mean there was there was quite a bit of resource to it when I went when I was younger. um but but in by by 2011 it, i think yeah so um, are you suggesting that we create a national heritage um uh, acknowledgement um uh, body or a of all the like a federal that acknowledges so like the unesco equivalent for world heritage sites we should have one for our own heritage sites that are all listed in one place in one archive in one library one resource center share all the knowledge stop the politics yeah, stop yeah, the games yeah so, yeah look, i, I think so I, I, look, i didn't want to share look. the information on it all the time there, there's a real lack of sharing of information i don't know what this hoarding hoarding mentality is it's very bizarre yeah, yeah i mean look i think um 
you know, I, I'm, I'm learning a lot from my work here. And um, I think one of the most interesting things uh, that I've come across while I've been here is this kind of collection and public dissemination of information, right? The government is collecting information, newspapers, they're collecting birth certificates, they're collecting photographs, they're collecting, you know, everything is being collected and it's being stored. Obviously, uh, for privacy reasons, it's not being, uh, you know, disseminated immediately. And it, there is a kind of filter to what you can access, but there is a lot of resource which is available publicly. It's available through libraries, it's available through the internet. Um, you know, there's, you can, you can find out what your, you know, it, because even building applications are made, made public, right? So, for example, if you have, um, if I'm doing some, if I'm like painting my house, I'm going to inform the government and the government is going to make that information publicly available, right? And so that information of me painting my house in 2020 will be available in 2051 or 2121, right? And so there is this, this, because you're constantly recording and making information publicly available in the present, there is this indication that it will be available in the future. And, and, and obviously, and because this is the, the, the system that has been in place since, you know, uh, since the first settlers, there is so much information in the public sphere on how the city evolved, how, you know, who lived here, um, who, uh, how, the, how, the, how the changes were made, what, what's in the ground, what's ar you know, what, what archeological deposits are there. Um, and, and so that makes that recording of history and understanding of history so much more easier because you have information that is publicly available. Um, and, and it's all available in one centralized system. You know, you, you, can, you can find it on the internet. You don't, 90% of the times, you don't even have to go to, um, to a, a library. You can just get it online. There are state archives. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the state of the state archives. I mean, like, for example, in Denso Hall, um, you know, there was there were building reports that were locked up in the in the clock tower, and there were like birds who were, you know, nesting on them. And these were documents from, you know, 1875, right? So I mean, that's how we're preserving our our paper records. And you know, there's this act, you know, that the action, the call to action is to actually digitize all of that because how can you learn if everything that is on paper is turning to dust. Yeah. Which it is it's disintegrating really fast, which brings me to my last point for today is that, okay, so let's see, we miraculously change our system of governance because remember our, all of these problems that are government based are in a bureaucratic structure that has mm. also been inherited by colonial bureaucratic structure that never thought we would need to have this discussion today. So their systems are not in place and therefore people are doing their own anarchic version of whatever they want with the heritage work, which is actually a public property, all of it, and belongs to everyone in the country, whether it's Karachi or it's Kalash. So that there's a fundamental restructuring that needs to happen there. And maybe, you know, I don't know if Marvi's still here or not, but she's involved with the federal government and this whole issue of heritage. It's something that I think that maybe she can take up um, in due course. But if all this stuff is digitized, how do you think that this kind of information will help the 18, 19 year old who's on here today, my ex students are on here today listening to you, in terms of future of education through heritage sites? Like, what, what is the role that you think that digitized can play for the future, like 20 years from now, 30 years from now, when we're gone? Look, I think, As, aside I, think from I think there's, I mean, there's, there's, the, as far as the colonial, um, 
kind of her, like handing down of of procedures or um, is concerned. The 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 issue is that that the the British actually had an amazing system of archiving and recording. And you can see that at the British uh, Museum, you can see it at the British Library. They have records of things that, you know, we don't have with us. And, and it's not, you know, I think, I think one of the biggest um, legacies that the British have left us is this meticulous uh, method of recording. And because, and, you know, I mean, there's like journals that, that ch chart, like, like record the charting of seas, you know? So, so it's not that that, that colonial... Um, like that, that the colonial legacy is what's holding us behind. I feel like there is, um, there is an, maybe it's, it's, it's a mentality uh, of, of someone else doing the work and me reaping the benefits. Like, I think that's what, what is a mentality, mentality that needs to be bro broken from. Um, and as far as what it would be used for, I think there's the, the uses are, are, you know, infinite, you know? I mean, uh, there, is, there is absolutely, I think, uh, predicting how this information will be used is, is uh, kind of naive because who would have thought that I would be sitting in Sydney and you would be sitting in Pakistan, Karachi, and we would be having this discussion because you know, right. you'd never know how technology, where technology takes you, what, what the world is take, uh, you know, headed towards. Yeah. Um, but, 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 but the importance of, of recording is that, um, and sharing, I think I think more so than recording is also sharing. I think that's that's something that is so valuable because heritage cannot be heritage unless it is shared, you know. And 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 memories cannot be made unless you share them with someone, you know. I mean, how many memories do you have of like, oh, I had such a good time. I was sitting in by myself, not talking to anyone. That that doesn't happen, right? Um, so. So it's it's so important to to kind of sh and and you know and and heritage and everything it's it's things that are shared right it's it's ideas that we share it's um it's history that we share it's it's uh, rituals that we share it's rights that we share it's 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 always shared and and this documentation if if we share it um there's there's an infinite uh, way to for 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 things to, for things to pan out. Do you think that we could use we could use? I mean, the sharing is another sensitive topic you hit because I don't know. People don't want to share. You know, uh, Marvi said the god, the old gods come in the way, and Nan said that you know it's just people in in between who are self and retain the information for some reason they think that they need to take this with them to their graves instead of sharing with future generations which is us which is the next lot and them after that I believe that if we don't share this heritage as you've rightfully identified we could be losing our sense of identity cultural identity will get thinner thinner and more ghostly the further we get from our heritage the archives the documents that have been created post Brits or anything that we have, like you said, to refer back to was what uh, the British documented when they were here. But somehow our bureaucratic system hasn't followed that. And mm. from then on, the documentation that's happened has been, uh, yes, some by the government. I don't think hugely thorough because I feel like many a times the person who's doing the documentation doesn't understand the material really well. The, the private sector has done their bit. The two don't communicate and share, like you said. And in the end, the pedagogical structures that need this content, right? The children that need to have access to this, the students that need to have access to this material, we're doing them such a disservice because they don't have access to this material. And so this sense of self and connecting and grounding to this region's earth, to the soil, is so not there, you know? Yeah, it's... it's, it's um 
Although I would say that that there is a lot more resource that's available now than it was when when I was in school or college. Um, uh, I feel like you know JSTOR and a lot of uh, universities have put a lot of their information on on online, um, and there is. Um, a lot more information that is available. Of course, there needs to be a whole bunch more that that is available. And and honestly, I've I've seen um, documents um, at the department that that have endless information, but it's just not for your eyes, right? Um, and mm. but I mean, it's it's just I don't know about the old gods either because. You know, it's you. We we can learn a lot from them as well, and there is this need to kind of even record what they know, because, like for example, how many of us actually even uh, recorded, um, you know, how our grand great grandparents lived, or how you know? I mean, hardly anyone even knows that. You know, we don't mm. even. You know, if you, you you're if your great grand or if your mom and dad are telling you stories of their young age, there is a there is a kind of aversion to even listen to that because it doesn't. I mean, I, and I think that's becoming more and more, and it's always been like this, I guess. But but there there is this aversion to kind of to the past, and especially in um, I feel in Pakistan because we're all looking to the future, and you know, let's just look straight ahead who wants to worry about what happened in the past and i feel like a lot of it has to do with sun was was created because there was this need to break away from india um so there there's this intrinsic need to break away from a past which is why it's so important, I feel, to kind of connect history to the to geography in the telling of history, to connect it to geography, because it gives you more roots rather than a more, you know, um, holistic kind of um, uh, regional identity. This is what this is what uh, we've been talking about, really. And for me, in all of my work, as you already know, is really key that we look at that. But um, for now, listen, we're almost out of time, Maria. And I think you've ended beautifully exactly what it is that we want to stay focused on, which is history that's regional based and geography based and not political boundaries, not the last 70 years, but much more ancient. But anyway, listen, thank you so much for your time. This has been amazing. I'm going to make a record of all of these questions and comments that have come in. Thank you, everyone, for your contribution and participation. That's what it's all about. Maria, thank you for your evening. So good to talk to you at peace after yeah. such a long time. Yeah, uh, I may come, come back on for us again. It's been amazing. Sure. Um, thank you for that acknowledgement. I'm going to think about how to do an acknowledgement for the diversity. Uh, yeah. For our diversity. Let me know what you come up with. <laughs> I'm going to you and I want to start doing that in our chat. So on that note, God bless you. Thank you so much. Khudafiz to you and your Thanks. Aborigine country. Love you so much. Take care. All right. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.